Welcome back, everybody. Let's continue to talk about central tendency. Remember, when it comes to central tendency, there are three primary measures, the mean, the median, and the mode. And each one of those is trying to describe the center of the distribution, where most of the data lies. Each measure has its strengths and weaknesses, and we want to make sure we understand when each one is most appropriate. The last time we were together, we talked about the mode, which is the most common score. We mentioned that it's a relatively simplistic measure, but it definitely has its time and its place. For example, we can use the mode with any type of data. That makes it incredibly flexible. But it's smart for us to explore other options. So today, let's talk about the median. The median is sometimes abbreviated MDN, and the median really is simply a midpoint. If you were to take all the scores in a data set and line them up from smallest to biggest, the median would simply be the point right in the middle. So the median really divides a distribution into two equal groups. And when I say equal groups, I mean an equal number of data points on each side. That's why I like to describe the median as the geometric average. It's the average based on its geometry where it's located. And here's another fun fact. The median is the 50th percentile. Because remember, the 50th percentile is the point at which 50% of the scores are at that point or less. So it's the point right in the middle. If you look closely, you'll see medians reported quite often. This is a good example right here. Almost any time you see average prices of homes listed in the media, those average prices will be expressed in terms of medians, median values. I'll tell you why medians are often used in that particular situation a little bit later on when we evaluate what we like and what we don't like so much about the median. But for now, let's talk about how we can actually compute the median. We're going to go through two examples. Here are the two examples right here. Let's look at this first one. Each box just represents one data point. Remember, for course-related purposes, we typically play with small data sets, so we're not crunching through numbers all day long. This data set has one, two, three, four, five pieces of data. There's a three, a five, an eight, a 10, and 11. And the way it's shown right here with these boxes, it helps you understand that the median really is this midpoint. If the data points are lined up from the smallest value all the way to the highest value, the median really is that point that splits the distribution in two. Here we can really see that the number eight is the geometric average. The number eight is the 50th percentile, the point at which 50% of the scores are at that value or lower. As you can see, it's going to be pretty simple to find the median. Let me just show you a couple tricks and a little procedure so that you get it right every time. So first, let's deal with example one, and we'll replicate this analysis right here. Okay, here's example one reproduced right here. The first thing that I want to do is just list our data because we're not going to be using this draw a box method. We, we don't need that. I'm going to show you a better way. In that data set, there is a three, there's a five, an eight, a 10, and an 11. In other words, our sample size, n, equals five. And here's a little handy dandy formula I can share with you. Not for finding the median, pay attention, not for finding the median, for finding the median's location. The median location equals the sample size plus one divided by two. So in this situation, when you just have five data points, it's pretty easy just to see where the middle is. But like I said, this little formula will make sure you get it right every single time. If we have a sample size of five, five plus one is six, and six divided by two equals three. That three is telling us that the median is in the third position. Because the median is the middle value, we always need to make sure we first order our data from smallest to highest, and we've already done that. Now I just want to determine which value is in the third position. Here's the first, here's the second, here's the third. That right there is our median. We can check our work by counting from the other side. Here's the first position, the second, and again, there's the third. So that value right there is our median, MDN. So as I mentioned, it's pretty easy to find the median. And at this point, that middle value is right there, that value of eight. When you start out with an odd number of data points, and in this small data set, we had five data points. 
When you start out with an odd number like that, there's always this one point in the middle that will be the median. In the next example, let me show you what we need to do when we have an even number of data points. In this example, using the build a box method, we can see that the median, the 50th percentile, the point right in the middle, is at a value of 4.5. Let's see if we can replicate that analysis using the strategy that I just taught you. Right here is example two, reproduced. Let's go ahead and list the data points, just like we did before. It looks like there are two values that equal three. There is a four, a five, a seven, and an eight. So our n in this situation equals one, two, three, four, five, six. Sample size equals six. Now that we know the sample size, let's figure out the median's location. Median location, I often abbreviate with an ML. And remember, the formula for the median's location is simply our sample size, n, plus 1, divided by 2. We determine that our n equals 6, 6 plus 1 equals 7, 7 divided by 2 equals 3.5. So again, that is not the median. It's simply the location for where we can find the median. 3.5 is telling us that the median is located right between the third and the fourth position. So of course, we have to order our data from lowest to highest. We've already done that. Let's find the value between the third and the fourth position. And we're going to average those two values. So here's the first position, second, there's the third, this is the fourth. We need to average those two values. Four plus five equals nine, and nine divided by two equals 4.5. So I just computed an average of those two values. And I'm just going to make that into an arrow because that's pointing right at the median value. So that right there, the value of 4.5 is the midpoint. 50% of the scores are at that value or lower. We can check our work by counting from the other side. Here's the first point, second point, third point. There's the fourth. We need to average those two. Just like we did already, we find a value of 4.5. So this analysis was pretty simple as well. And in this case, the median simply falls between two data points. So in this case, the median value equals 4.5. Remember, every technique that we use has its strengths and its weaknesses. The median works particularly well when we have outliers in our data. And I don't know how much you know about home values, but if you look in almost any neighborhood, there are gonna be some homes that are worth a lot more money than the others. In other words, some homes in a neighborhood are outliers when compared with others. Outliers are just extreme values. So in a neighborhood where most homes are worth somewhere around $150,000, if there's a home worth a million dollars, that home would be an outlier. It's an extreme value amongst all the others. One problem with computing a simple average, what in statistics we call a mean, is that means are very much influenced by outlier values. So when you take those outlier homes and you mix them into the rest of the neighborhood, it makes it look like the neighborhood has an average home value that's much higher than it really is. The beautiful thing about medians is that they are not influenced at all by those outliers. So when we can order our data from lowest to highest, we can compute a median. And when you have ordered data that includes outliers, you almost certainly want to compute a median. Let's go back to this first example, and let me show you what I mean when I tell you that medians are not affected at all by outliers. Of course, we're just playing with some numbers right here. Let's just say for a second that we realize that that last value is incorrect. And it's not supposed to be 11. It's supposed to be 11,000. That's a huge difference. Imagine if I was taking all those values and I was computing a mean. If I was computing a mean, changing that value from 11 to 11,000 would have an enormous impact on the mean. The mean would get much, much larger. But let's take a look and see what happens to the median. The median is still based on one, two, three, four, five different scores, five different data points. Five plus one equals six, six divided by two equals three, so the median location still remains the same. And in fact, in this situation, the median doesn't change at all. The median still equals the value 8. So when we have outliers in our data, just like that value right there, 
The median doesn't care. The median's not affected at all. Well, that's the point you really want to remember. About the only reason that people are really looking at medians is because means are so affected by those outliers. I mentioned that housing prices often include outliers, so almost always when you're hearing about real estate values, people report medians. The same thing is true with salaries. Imagine some large company. Most people working for that company probably make a, a reasonable income, you know, somewhere under $200,000, let's say. But the CEO for some major company might make millions and millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. If we were to compute an average salary for the people who work at that company, including those outliers, would look like the average salary is boosted up higher than it really is. So when we report average salaries, the average that's often used is a median instead of a mean. This graphic just shows you exactly what I've just been talking about. When there's an outlier score among a bunch of other scores, the mean starts chasing after the outlier. If this 12 were a 13 or a 14 or a 15, this mean value would get larger and larger and larger. That's why I'm always saying that means chase after outliers. But what happens to the median? Nothing. It just stays there right in its place, right in the middle. All right, we come to that point where we start talking about the things we like and the things we don't like so much about the median, which is just the midpoint, the 50th percentile. Here's really the biggest downfall of the median. It is not mathematically derived. And remember what that means. That means there's no formula for computing the median. I did show you a formula for finding the median's location, but that is not a formula for computing the median. Because the median is not mathematically derived, we can't build upon it. In general, we can't develop more sophisticated procedures for which we would use the median. So that's a major frowny face. What do we like about the median? Well, with outliers and skewed distributions, the median is much less reactive than the mean. That's a real good thing. We're going to learn that of the three measures of central tendency, we really like the mean. The mean is going to be our default measure of central tendency. All things being equal, compute the mean. However, if you have outliers in your data, don't compute the mean. Compute the median instead. Here's another really nice thing. We can use the median with almost any type of data, any data that can be ordered. So here we're talking about ordinal, interval, or ratio scale data. If we have nominal scale data, we can't order that data. And the best we can do in terms of central tendency is finding the mode. However, with any other type of data, we can order it. Ordinal, interval, or ratio level data can be ordered. And if you can order the data, you can find the midpoint. We can even find the midpoint when we have open-ended distributions. Let me show you what I mean by that. When psychologists administer more sophisticated intelligence tests, People need to not only answer a variety of questions, they often need to perform various tasks. So one task might be to complete some type of a puzzle. And you know, some people complete those puzzles very quickly. Some people never get it completed. And at some point, the person administering the test needs to say, okay, we've spent enough time on that, let's move on. So in those situations, we're left with an open-ended distribution. There are some values in our data set that are essentially undetermined. There'd be no way that you can compute a mean with that type of data. Just imagine if I'm trying to compute a simple average, a mean, based on this list of data right here. Once I get to that value, never finished, I'm stuck dead in my tracks. However, we can compute the middle value. We can compute the median. Let me show you how. We're going to work with this data set just like any other data set, even though it has that one value, never finished. The first thing we need to do to find the median is find the median's location. So I'll remind us of that formula. Median location equals our sample size plus one divided by two. In this particular situation, our sample size equals one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six data points. Six plus one is seven divided by two equals 3.5. So the median is between the third and the fourth location. Let's just start counting. Here's the first location, second, there's the third, there's the fourth. We simply need to average these two. So in this case, the median value is 12.5.
and that's what I computed right here. So in this respect, the median is really very flexible. But there's still that nagging thing. The median is not mathematically derived. We can't build upon it and create more sophisticated statistical procedures. So what we're going to need to do is look next at the mean. And you're going to see the mean is mathematically derived. And that's going to be why the mean is our default measure of central tendency. We'll talk much more about it in the next video. In the meantime, be safe.